How sweet the sound of saving grace. Lord Jesus, your blood was spilled, your body was beaten and bruised and crushed. The author of life was put to death. You went willingly, you laid down your own life in a very real sense, no one took it from you, and you took up your life again in defeat of the grave, conquering death for yourself and for all who would put their trust in you. These are the songs we know we will sing for eternity, songs of your redemptive work, songs of your dying in the place of sinners, reconciliation, salvation. All of these things glorify you, Lord Jesus, because they reveal who you are, the kind of God that loves and rescues sinners like us. We ask this morning as we open your word that we would be again moved by the truth of the gospel, but unmoved from the proclamation of the gospel as long as you give us breath. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll be looking really at one phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 14, where Paul says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. This is part of our series on a philosophy of ministry, and as we've been talking, a philosophy of ministry is that set of convictions, those core principles that drive what a church does, what a ministry does. And so on the outer surface of things, we see the programming, we see the various activities, we we come in on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and turn on the lights and join together. But there is a set of guiding principles that guide and direct all that we do. That is the philosophy of ministry that the elders hold. And so far, we've covered a number of these. Preach the word, shepherd the flock, equip the saints, grow the church, make disciples, follow the script, identify error. And this morning, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. We're going to talk this morning about maintaining the critical place that the gospel must hold in the church, in our church. The gospel of Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, is a watershed, is a watershed. Gray's Peak, Colorado at 14,278 feet is the tallest point of land in the continental divide in North America. That continental divide is that uh, run of mountains that with waterfalls on one side, it goes to the Pacific Ocean. If it falls on the other side, it goes to the Atlantic Ocean via the Gulf of Mexico. And if you imagine a blanket of snow on the top of a ridge on Gray's Peak, and it looks like just one solid blanket, all one unity, kind of all together, and yet one snowflake may melt and fall thousands of miles away from its next-door neighbor snowflake that melts and goes the other direction. The gospel is a watershed with infinite differences in eternal destinies. A narrow line divides all of humanity for all of the uncountable ages of eternity future. And that line is the gospel. Maintaining the gospel is of critical importance. It is to be a chief focus for any ministry. It's important for us to define the gospel. We used to ask this question when we lived in Nashville. What is the gospel? Oh, that's a kind of music. Wait, is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No, it's the Bible. You get a lot of different answers about what is the gospel. It's important for us as we begin this morning in our identification of a philosophy of ministry entitled Preach the Gospel, that we define the gospel. What do we mean by gospel? The word very simply means good news, and the gospel is the great news of God saving sinners. And we can articulate the gospel any number of ways. You can use three words like J.I. Packer and say the gospel is adoption through propitiation. Or we could talk about the good news of substitutionary atonement. That is, by the substitute death of another, we are made at one with God. 
It is a death in payment for sin producing reconciliation, adoption. We can talk about a, an outline for the gospel. This is an outline we walk through in our baptism class. God, man, Christ, faith, God. What do we mean by that? God is holy. Man is sinful. Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, intercession, glorification. In the place of man is the only hope for man's sins to be forgiven. And man must respond in faith and repentance, two sides of the same coin, turning from your sin and turning to God, surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that his death in your place pays for your sin and entrusting your very life to his care. All of that to bring you back to God, right? The great news of the gospel is not, I got my sins forgiven. Look, I have a blank slate. Everybody look. The great news of the gospel is I get my sins forgiven by the death of Christ so that I get God, so that I am brought into reconciled relationship with my maker, so that I become the inheritor of the infinite riches of what it means to belong to God, to know him. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you and the one whom you've sent. And you and I have no business knowing God, being related to God, being adopted into God's family, being reconciled into his fellowship, standing in his presence. We have no business with any of these things as we are, as we are born, as we are naturally. Sinners. Sinners by nature and sinners by activity. We can refer to the gospel as God's grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Of all the many ways to articulate the gospel, it is one simple truth. God loved sinners in this way. He set his son to die and to rise from the dead on behalf of everyone who would believe so that they will enjoy rather than be incinerated by his glorious presence. Belief in the gospel, repentance from sin and unto God is the fruit of new birth. A supernatural work of God by his Holy Spirit in the heart of an unbeliever to give him life and light and awareness of his condition and a crying out to God in faith and a turning to Christ. This new birth is something you can't produce any more than you could have produced your first birth. You must be born from above. And everyone who turns to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin Everyone who is convinced that he is the sinner, that she is the sinner against a holy God, and that only Christ will do, only Jesus' death in my place will satisfy God's wrath, everyone who believes that will find himself to have been born of God, and everything changes. A new creature emerges. The gospel is the great watershed of eternal destinies. We were born spiritually dead, and all of a sudden, by the gospel, we are inheritors of eternal life. This morning's outline is a little bit unusual. Normally, the sermon outline is derived from a text, and we break the text into parts and allow the text of Scripture to actually determine the sermon outline. This morning's a little bit different, and I'm not commending this approach as the norm. We're going to talk this morning about five strategies, five effective strategies for maintaining the critical place of the gospel in the church. And the first strategy is going to be the text we're looking at this morning. The other four strategies will flow out of that text through the New Testament, through church history, down to our day, and into this church. My hope this morning is that the love that we have as a church for the gospel will never wane that it will never go away, that we will not drift or drop our guard or become delinquent or negligent in our stewardship of this great news for mankind. If the church forsakes the gospel, she has nothing else to offer the world. She is no better than the Elks Lodge or the United Nations or the 4-H Club. The church must always do what only the church can do, Proclaim the death of Jesus Christ in the place of sinners until he returns. So this morning, 
five strategies for maintaining the critical place of the gospel in the church. Strategy number one, we're going to observe Paul's unwavering commitment to the gospel. We're going to look at Paul's unwavering commitment to the gospel. And we see this in this verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Paul says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul here in his letter to the Corinthian church is defending his ministry. The Corinthian believers were a mixed up lot. And Paul pours out love to this church, a few letters to this church. And at times the apostolic ministry that was given to Paul by Jesus Christ is in the dock. It's on the defensive in the minds of the Corinthian believers. Paul here in this verse wants the Corinthians to understand why he is not taking money for gospel ministry. Paul decided to provide for his own living while proclaiming the truth in Corinth. In other locations, he was supported financially. And even in this letter to the Corinthians, he defends biblically the idea that those who labor for the gospel should get their living from the gospel. Look at verse 9 of chapter 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And he goes on and says, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Look down a few verses. Verse 15, or verse 14. So the Lord directed those who proclaimed the gospel to get their living from the gospel. And Paul says in verse 15, but I have used none of these things. I'm not writing so that it will be done so in my case, for it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. What is this boast? Paul wants to be able to speak freely of the gospel without taking money so that no one would confuse his labors as mercenary, as if Paul is just some soldier for hire. And so he worked with his hands. He provided for himself. He says in verse 12, I didn't want to cause any hindrance to you in preaching the gospel. Some Corinthian Christians critiqued Paul for being in it for the money. He wanted to disprove that. Some belittled him for not getting paid for ministry. You're not respectable at all unless people pay you for what you're doing. Paul couldn't win. But he wanted to remove from their minds any thought that his missionary work with them was for hire, that he was a soldier of fortune, preaching and teaching and making disciples of Jesus just for the paycheck at the end of each day. And with Paul, nothing could have been further from the truth. Look at verse 16. He says, he has nothing to brag about if he preaches the gospel. It's no credit to me if I preach the gospel. It's no boast to me if I preach the gospel. Why? Because, he says, notice this, I am under compulsion. He says, literally, it is a necessity to me. Why is Paul so driven? Why is he under compulsion? He explains it in the last phrase of verse 16. Notice, he says, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Listen, I don't boast for preaching the gospel. I'm under compulsion. Why am I under compulsion? Because woe to me if I don't. This simple statement, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, offers us a window into what drove the Apostle Paul. What was it that made Paul endure labors, imprisonments, beatings, mortal dangers, lashes, stoning, shipwrecks, being hunted down, sleepless, in hunger and thirst, cold and exposed? What was it that made Paul say in 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen? He finishes the thought, so that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Paul had an unwavering commitment to the proclamation of the gospel. He knew it was the difference between an eternal life or eternal death for everyone who would hear him. And for Paul personally, it flows out of his very testimony. 
In Acts chapter 9, Jesus is speaking of Paul and says, The Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And as you know, Paul had been an enemy of the church, an enemy of the gospel, persecuting believers, even overseeing the stoning of Stephen. And Paul was confronted by Jesus. He describes that event in Acts 26 before King Agrippa. Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus, and Paul said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. And listen to his job description in verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Paul was commissioned by Jesus to preach the gospel. How could he go back on that? In Romans 1, 14, he says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, to the wise and the foolish. In Galatians 1, he talks about being set apart by God even from his mother's womb and then called by God's grace that God was pleased to reveal his son in Paul so that he might preach Jesus among the Gentiles. You see, Paul was a slave. He was a slave of Jesus Christ. His will was not his own. And Paul was an apostle. That word means a sent one. He has been specially commissioned as the apostle to the Gentiles to go beyond Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to go to the uttermost parts of the earth with the saving message of the gospel of Jesus. And Paul feels the weight of these responsibilities When Moses was called, he was scared. When Jonah was called, he was a bigot. But Paul goes happily to Jew, to Gentile, to every class of people in every place, happy to suffer if only he can fulfill his commission. And he feels the weight of these responsibilities like an Old Testament prophet calling down woes. This woe is me, it kind of sounds like something out of Shakespeare or Edgar Allan Poe. It's not a phrase we use very often, but but you see it in the Old Testament prophets. Like Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Or woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Isaiah 45, woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. Or Jeremiah 23, speaking of the false hypocrite leaders of Israel. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. Ezekiel 34, similarly, woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should they not feed the flock? And Jesus picks up this woe language in Matthew 23 with a tirade of woes against the Pharisees. He says in verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. It's interesting when the prophets turn those woes upon the people onto themselves. Jeremiah the prophet in Lamentations 5 said, Woe to us, for we have sinned. And Isaiah, after giving five chapters of woes against the people, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. John 12 tells us that what Isaiah saw in that woe was the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, having seen the Lord Jesus Christ, glorious and risen from the dead, and then commissioned by Jesus to preach the gospel, (laughs) utters this woe against himself if he didn't. Woe is me. If I preach not the gospel. A woe is a cry of wailing, of coming disaster and the judgment of God. 
Paul knew that he was liable to the evaluation of God for his faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel. Paul must preach the gospel. This is why he was selected from birth. This is why he was redeemed from a life of hypocrisy and slavery to sin under law. To preach the gospel. And woe to Paul if he doesn't preach the gospel. This is why he says in 1 Corinthians 9.16, I have nothing to boast of if I'm preaching the gospel. I am only doing what I must. And it is what he loves. And so Paul preached the gospel to Jews and to Gentiles. He preached the gospel to unbelievers. And he preached the gospel to believers. The letter to the Romans is, is an entire letter explaining the gospel to believers. He preached the gospel to kings and to prisoners. He reminded pastors of the gospel and churches of the gospel. He defended the gospel against his detractors and against its attackers. Paul's whole life revolved around proclaiming the gospel, establishing Christians and churches in the gospel, and fighting for the purity of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, he says this, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it's not that Paul never articulated anything other than Jesus died for sinners. In fact, Paul wrote the most number of books in the New Testament and 28% of the content of the New Testament. But this statement, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, marks the importance and the centrality of the gospel for Paul in everything that he did and said and wrote. You and I are not the Apostle Paul. We do not have his commission. We do not have his ministry. We are nevertheless custodians of the same gospel message. None are called to a ministry exactly like Paul's. But no Christian is exempt from making God's grace known. If you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are a trophy of God's grace and by very definition, a herald of the gospel. A good strategy for us in maintaining the critical place of the gospel in our church is to see Paul's heart, to see his life, and to hear him say, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. A second strategy for us for maintaining the critical place of the gospel in the church is to examine the relationship between the church and the gospel in the New Testament. What is the relationship between the church and the gospel throughout the New Testament? And so we're going to begin in Matthew and read the New Testament. We'll highlight just a few things. In Acts 2, Peter preached the gospel. People believed the gospel, and that day, according to Acts 2.41, 3,000 souls were added to the assembly of believers, the church. Acts 2.47 tells us the Lord was adding to that number day by day those who were being saved. So notice a couple of things. Who's doing the work? God is. This is the work of new birth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's happening through the proclamation of what? The gospel. On the lips of Peter first, and then the apostles, and then everybody else. And the gospel is spreading like wildfire, and God is adding to their number day by day. Paul tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by a word about Christ. The church does not grow unless people believe. And people believe by placing their faith in Jesus Christ, and they place their faith in Jesus Christ by hearing about Christ. The importance of gospel proclamation for the church is that gospel proclamation produces the people who populate the church. Without gospel proclamation, you cannot have the church. The church would die. The church is self-perpetuating in its proclamation of the gospel. Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, that he planted, Apollos watered, by planting, Paul means preaching the gospel, but it was God who caused the growth. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we see that the church is God's building, and individual Christians are members of it, we are parts of it. 
And God warns us that each man is to be careful how he builds on this building, the church, how you do work in this ministry called the church, and each man's work will be tested by fire. The things that we do that don't last for eternity, the the wood, the hay, the straw, Jesus evaluates. Some building efforts turn out to be worthless. And only eternal things will endure heaven's evaluation. In Revelation 1 to 3, we see that Jesus is the one who walks among the lampstands. The lampstands in Revelation chapter 1 are the churches. A lampstand's task is to hold a lamp. And the lamp is Jesus Christ and the gospel that saves sinners. And the church's task is to be the lampstand on which the lamp rests And Jesus walks among the lampstands, evaluating them. He's the owner of the church, head of the church, and he has the authority to remove those lampstands when they fail to live up to their purpose. By the way, those seven congregations described in Revelation 2 and 3 do not exist as churches today. Those lamps went out. Revelation 5, 5 and 6, we see the throne room of heaven and those concentric circles of worship, the four living creatures or the myriads and myriads, uncountable numbers of angelic beings surrounding the throne and the lamb and the uncountable number of the redeemed and, and all of them singing, singing praise to Jesus. They are crying out, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Because he purchased for him, for God, with his own blood, people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. We find out that heaven never graduates from the gospel of the lamb slain. From the beginning of the church to the end of the church age, into the days when Jesus will reign on the earth, no one receives eternal life without being born again through the gospel. Peter says this in 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven for us who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It is the death of Jesus Christ in our place. It is the new birth procured by the Holy Spirit in our hearts that brings us into God's family, the church. There's no church without believers. I know there are organizations with the name church or the word church in their name. But you don't have the true church without regeneration. The church is to be the custodian of the gospel. And the church has been tasked to take this gospel to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the age. And the church must do what only the church is equipped to do. And Christians must do what only Christians can do, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world can provide entertainment. Medicine can bring physical health. Technology can improve a standard of living. Schools can provide education. Social organizations can give a sense of community and belonging. The world can do all of these things. But what the world cannot provide, what man most desperately needs, is the gospel. And if the church, those born again by the Spirit of God, spend all of their time and resources duplicating what the world provides but neglects the gospel, then a sea of humanity marches relentlessly to hell, perhaps educated, clothed, entertained, fed, but dead, groomed, and doomed. There is one primary task for the church. And it's not that the church can't participate in good things that help people in a temporary sense. But we have to understand the scale of eternity and that great watershed reality that only by the gospel do people be reconciled to God for eternity. The gospel answers the pressing question of humanity. 
How is a sinner reconciled to a holy God? Or to put it another way, how can God forgive my sins and maintain his good and just reputation? Only the gospel. Only the Son of God dying on the cross in the place of sinners. Woe to us if we do not preach the gospel. I want us to consider a third strategy this morning for maintaining the critical place of the gospel in our church. And that is to consider the relationship between the church and the gospel in history. The church was birthed in Acts chapter 2 in the mid-30s A.D. What has happened in the last nearly 2,000 years? Well, the custodians of the gospel fumbled Like a running back entrusted with a football, the church has fumbled again and again and again, sometimes on their own one-yard line, sometimes after carrying the ball far down the field. And we could take comfort in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and hell will not prevail against it. But that is not a promise of any individual local assembly of believers any brand of church, any denomination of church, or any state church, or any zip code, or any language in which the gospel is held. The true church of Jesus the Messiah throughout history has occupied different geographies. The letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, was a, that was a hotbed of evangelistic fervor. It was the place from which the gospel was going. And it is hard to find gospel witness there now. The genuine followers of Jesus have spoken different languages, worn different denominational names. They have often been on the run from organizations that call themselves the church, many of which were the church at one point. Consider how often we have to rename ourselves. Have you thought about this? I'm a Christian. A Christian originally was a derogatory term referred to those who loved Jesus, believed in Jesus, followed Jesus, and acted like Jesus. That term was coined at Antioch for the first time. Christians, little Christs. It was a put down. And we wore it proudly. And eventually, Christians came to entail lots of people that were not born again. Born again. Christendom became a political territory of people who just weren't something else. They were born into that geopolitic, and so you're a Christian. The whole watershed has been obscured. The dividing line has been blurred when everybody's a Christian. And so at one point, we took the name Protestant. We were protesting against the fact that the gospel had been lost by the church, fumbled, And the Protestants picked up the ball and ran with it, proclaiming the gospel. But now the word Protestant can mean lots of people that aren't born again, of lots of different persuasions. It just means I'm not Catholic, or maybe I don't even know what it means. And then there was evangelical. Evangelical were those Christian Protestants who believed the evangel, the gospel, the good news. What kind of a Christian are you? I'm a Protestant. What kind of a Protestant are you? I'm an evangelical Protestant. And evangelical has lost its meaning. Lots of people claim the label evangelical and are not born again. Lots of people claim the name evangelical and proclaim doctrines contrary to the evangel. And they've held the label and lost its power. The watershed has been obscured. The dividing line has been blurred. So we're reformed. We're born-again, Bible-believing, Reformed, Evangelical, Protestant Christians. And we'll have to come up with something else in about three weeks. All of this renaming has been an attempt by those who are born again by the Holy Spirit through the good news of our crucified and resurrected Savior. All of it is an attempt to distinguish ourselves from those who are not born again, who do not preach Christ and Him crucified. And the point is not stay away from us and away from our labels. No, it's understand the watershed and preach the gospel to everything that moves. Listen, 
Christians are not off limits for gospel proclamation. Protestants are not off limits for gospel proclamation. Evangelicals are not off limits for gospel proclamation. Bible church people are not off limits for gospel proclamation. You must be born again. And we must preach the gospel. A cycle has been repeated throughout 2,000 years of church history. People hear and believe the gospel. The church is birthed or rebirthed. Then the gospel gets lost. An organization remains. But Ichabod, the gospel has left the building. Catholic used to mean universal. Everybody that is a follower of Jesus, everywhere, no matter where they are. And Roman Catholicism has come to mean something else. A slow slide into the outright denial and persecution of the gospel. The Lutherans broke from Catholicism. Papua New Guinea, the mountains are populated with Lutherans who don't know the gospel. (laughs) Haven't heard the gospel. Don't know Luther either. The Methodists... Methodism was a derogatory term given to English, Anglican church, Church of England people who in studying for the Anglican priesthood got saved and began preaching regeneration and the doctrines of sovereign grace. Still considering themselves Anglican but preaching the gospel and their detractors called them Methodists. They were rigid in their method of proclaiming these doctrines. And eventually the church got angry with these gospel preachers. Removed them from their fellowships. They they formed societies. And eventually those societies became denominations and churches. And yet today, in America, how difficult is it to find a Methodist church preaching Substitutionary atonement, a bloody cross, Jesus' death in our place as the only way to heaven. At one point, the Methodists were the preachers of the first great awakening. Charles Wesley, John Wesley, John Whitfield, and others. George Whitfield. The Bible church movement was birthed out of the Bible conference movement. In the early 20th century, the mainline denominations in America had bought into German liberalism. It had seeped into American seminaries. A new generation of pastors came into pulpits in American mainline denominations, preaching that the Bible was not inerrant, that miracles were not to be believed, that there was no virgin birth, that that if Jesus existed and if he died, it was more just a demonstration of God's love towards people but didn't actually accomplish anything. And, and the little old ladies sitting in their churches, getting a new pastor straight out of seminary, wondering, where's Jesus? Began to attend conferences so they could hear the gospel. They began to attend conferences so they could hear the word of God preached faithfully by men who actually believed the gospel and were born again. And those Bible church conferences became Bible churches And the cycle continues. Only God knows what is the future of the Bible church movement. Some of you have traveled in Europe and you've seen those beautiful church buildings that at times could not hold the throngs of people eager to hear the gospel. Buildings that are now empty. Many of them museums commemorating a bygone era. Dust collects on pulpits that once housed the heralds of the grace of God. Some of you have been in Geneva and Amsterdam and Edinburgh and London. Cities that once overflowed with gospel preaching and sent missionaries all over the globe. Cities that are now bereft of the gospel. In more recent history... We've had coalitions that have formed to preserve the proclamation of the gospel. And within a decade, those coalitions are drifting from the very things they set out to protect and proclaim. 
musical genres emerged in the last decade with primarily the purpose to proclaim the gospel and have moved on to other things. Woe to us if we do not preach the gospel. Let me give you a fourth strategy for maintaining the critical place of the gospel in our church. Be wary of threats to the gospel. Be wary of threats to the gospel. And I don't mean external threats, but internal threats. Of course, the world is going to be opposed to the gospel. We expect that. We, we want to proclaim the gospel to the world around us. But how does a church go from preaching the gospel to denying the gospel? Every church that has done this, every training institution, Bible college, seminary that has done this in church history has a different story. Sometimes there's a quick defection, other times a slow slide. But I want to list some of the threats to the gospel. These aren't the only threats. There are others we could name, and these are in no particular order. The first one I want to identify is a declining bibliology, a declining bibliology. You know, people read the Bible and they see Jonah being swallowed by a fish and they think, well, that can't happen. But I still want Jesus. Or the, the world is only how many years old? And, and God made it in six days? Uh, the, the scientific world knows that that's not true. Evolution's true. And, and we begin to deny the biblical truth at various bits and points and we don't see the connection between denying inerrancy and the gospel. But the same God who created the world in six days is the one who shines in our hearts to give us the light of the gospel of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. He speaks new life out of nothing. In other words, God's identity and his power for the gospel is predicated on his identity and power as creator. Right? He is a creator with redemptive purpose and a redeemer with creative power. These things go together throughout the scriptures and God stakes his identity on that very reality. To deny one is to undermine the other. You can't say, oh, I love the gospel, but these embarrassing things in the Bible I need to be rid of. Princeton Seminary is an interesting case in point. Heroes, godly men, B.B. Warfield and others who were staunch defenders of biblical truth. Thought there might be something about Darwinian theory that was acceptable and, and engaging and, and useful and brought it into Princeton Seminary. And, and I've only been there once. <laughs> Went there to visit uh, Jonathan Edwards. I wanted to see where he was uh, buried. Uh, the students didn't know where he was. They asked, what dorm room is he in? Um, <laughs> We had a short church history lesson. <laughs> then I found his gravesite. They have long since run away from the things on which they were founded. And the death of Princeton was a declining bibliology. Here's another threat to the gospel, forgetting. Forgetting. Forgetting our rescue. Not smelling the, the singed hairs on the forearms as we escaped the fires of hell by the grace of God and his love for sinners. Do you remember your rescue? Go back and read your Old Testament and, and look for the verbs remember and forget over and over and over again. The, the Israelites brought out of Egypt through the Exodus forgot. And they were charged by the prophets over and over and over again, remember. And we need to do the same thing. A third threat to the gospel is restlessness. Restlessness. Wanderlust. We just get bored. We want something else. Been there, done that. Give me something new. You have to be wary of that in your heart. A theological restlessness or a community restlessness really is a lack of faith and a lack of love. I'm not content and I don't trust God's truth and I want something that might be just around the corner. Or I'm not selflessly loving God's people and I think there might be better community for me somewhere else where they'll love me better. It's just a restlessness we have to watch out for. A fourth threat to the gospel is the Romans 12.2 pressure. Pressure. 
That's the external pressure where the, the world is trying to squeeze us into its mold. And the command there is, do not be squozen. <laughs> and, and I'm not so concerned with the word, hey, stop squeezing me. But, but the warning is to the church, don't be squeezed. Listen, you have the answers the world needs. They're running headlong towards hell. And of course, they're going to tell you, stop preaching the gospel, stop preaching the gospel, because it's a threat to the way they want to live. But that shouldn't stop you. If you have compassion on a, on a passenger train running off a broken bridge into a chasm, you don't care what the people think about you as they go by in the windows. You're trying some way, somehow to stop the train. A fifth threat to the gospel is assuming the gospel. Just assuming the gospel. We love the gospel. Yep, got it. What else? D.A. Carson has pointed out, it often happens in a church where you get some sort of revival or a birthing or a, a fresh believers, first generation Christians, and they love the gospel, they love the gospel, they preach the gospel to their kids, and that generation comes up having heard the gospel from NGM all the way through student ministries, all the way to Bible college, and they assume the gospel. They forgot what it was like to have, to have lived a life apart from Christ and then to have Christ. And they grow up under their parents hearing about Jesus all the time. And man, there's got to be something else out there, right? And a church that assumes the gospel. By the way, uh, Scott Demers, thank you for that announcement. You want to preach the gospel? Join Next Generation Ministries. And make sure the next generation does not assume the gospel. Number six, hyphenate the gospel. Hyphenate the gospel. Say the word gospel. This is a threat to the gospel. Threat number six. Say the word gospel and put a dash after it and attach another word. We, we put our favorite issue onto the gospel, whether it's a good issue, a bad issue, a biblical, an unbiblical issue, and we put it on there like an ugly trailer on a really beautiful truck thinking that the trailer is going to look better and people will pay attention to this ugly trailer because it's attached to a beautiful truck. And we elevate our issue. Listen, the gospel is so important, so critical. I've got my other issue over here. So I'll call it a gospel issue. And all of a sudden, my favorite issue becomes just as important, just as critical, just as beautiful, wonderful. And everybody else has to listen to it because we have to abide by the gospel. We have to proclaim the gospel. So if I can hitch my issue to it, it gets proclaimed too. And what we do is we bring the gospel down and eventually replace the gospel altogether. Don't hyphenate the gospel. Seventh threat is contextualizing the gospel. Contextualizing the gospel. We think that the gospel is not going to be understood unless we put it in the language of the people we're talking to. And that's right. If, if I'm an English speaker and I go to France, I better learn French. <laughs> that's okay, and if we want to call that contextualization, I'm getting into that context and making the gospel clear. But I cannot compromise the gospel in order to make it palatable. I cannot change the message in order to make it understandable. And I can't even change the methodology by which God says the gospel is to be proclaimed. Because the foolishness of the methodology goes with the power of the message. And we undermine the gospel if we do it any way but God's way. An eighth threat is the periphery replacing the center. There's a lot of things, you know, the, our philosophy of ministry is a lot of things, right? Um, it, we don't just stand here every week and proclaim substitutionary atonement. The New Testament gives us a lot of things the church must be about. Not everything has the same importance. And when we put something that should be secondary or peripheral to the gospel in the center, we lose the gospel. And then all those things that were good and important and, and things that even flow out of our love for Christ, they become worthless if we've left the gospel. 
A ninth threat to the gospel is for you, individual Christian, to stop fighting sin, to stop repenting, to stop rehearsing gospel truths when you recognize your sin, take it before the Lord, and cling to the cross of Jesus Christ as the only hope of forgiveness. Stop doing that, and we'll lose the gospel. You sin every day. Catalog your sins, see them the way God sees them, take them before God in prayer, and rehearse the truths of what Jesus Christ did in your place. Pick up a favorite Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Insert your name, insert your sin. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, who knew no coveting, to become coveting on Smedley's behalf so that Smedley might become the righteousness of God in him. Take gospel truths, truths of substitutionary atonement, and apply them to your sin on a daily basis as a regular discipline in prayer before the Lord, and you will be a gospel proclaimer. Because when you meet another sinner, I can get where you are. I know what you need, and my Savior is great. Look what he's done for me. Stop fighting sin with the gospel, and you'll stop proclaiming the gospel. A tenth threat is to replace the power of the cross with human ingenuity. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. And then there's probably threats we don't see coming. One last strategy for maintaining the critical place of the gospel in the church. Let's ponder together some means that we use at Grace Bible Church for proclaiming and protecting the gospel. Number one, we sing. Almost all of our songs deal with substitutionary atonement. A bloody cross, Jesus' death in our place. That's on purpose. We know those aren't the only Christian songs out there. We know that's not the the, the only songs that the church has sung throughout history, but we as a church want the gospel to be sung and heard week in and week out without fail. So our preference, not a biblical command, our preference is to saturate our singing with the death of Jesus in our place. The second thing we do is the Lord's table every week. The Bible doesn't say do communion every week. The Bible says as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. There are churches that do it once a quarter, once a month, special seasons, whatever. That's fine. As a preference, the pastors at Grace Bible Church want to remember the Lord's death every week. There's a danger in that it becomes rote. (laughs) We pray against that. We labor against that. You hear a fresh exposition of God's word every week explaining the death of Christ from another angle from the elders of the church so that these things stay fresh. And and God's kindness to us in regularly remembering the Lord's death is a reset on confession, a reset on self-examination, a reset on rejoicing in the forgiveness Jesus purchased for us. A third means for us is preaching. Preaching God's word, preach the word. Um, We do regular, consecutive exposition, verse by verse through books of the Bible. That will get us to gospel proclamation. By the way, um, one of the reasons that we love communion every week is that if I'm preaching a passage, if one of the pastors is preaching a text, if Scott is preaching a text that doesn't directly touch on substitutionary atonement, guess what? You've already sung it, we've prayed it, and you've heard it in our time of the Lord's table. So thankful for that. And in preaching, even if the passage has nothing to do with substitutionary atonement, we try to get there some way, somehow. Sometimes there is a really easy bridge to get to the gospel, and sometimes there's no bridge at all. I'm going to preach on wisdom from Proverbs 1. Okay, that's done. Now, I want to tell you, if you don't have wisdom, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to get to the gospel because we want to. There's no Bible verse that says every time you preach the word, you have to mention Jesus died for sins. But we want to. We want to do that. I'll never forget reading of Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching in London in World War II. And German bombs are falling on London. And he used to have a strategy of preaching law and the problem of man on Sunday mornings. And the solution on Sunday nights. Come back tonight for the answer. (laughs) Until one particular daytime bombing raid killed hundreds of people 
within blocks of Lloyd Jones' church. And he said, some of those people might have been back here Sunday night. And from that point on, he decided, I'm never going to preach a sermon without getting to the cross. I'm not going to wait till Sunday night. In our small groups, our core questions are designed to take us back to the cross, right? Who are you sharing the gospel with is one of the questions. The other question is, how are you addressing sin in your life via the promises of the gospel? We have relationships with other churches in the valley that are faithfully proclaiming the gospel, and we are careful about our associations. We don't want to hitch our wagons to associations and coalitions and organizations that will defect. And we're careful about those things. There are some in our body who regularly preach the gospel on Mill Avenue. If you want to join them Thursday night, see Robert Hornack, Omri Miles, some of the other fellows do that. There are those who preach in a convalescent home on Sunday afternoons. Uh, There's information at the table about how to participate in that. But the biggest way that we preach the gospel at Grace Bible Church is you. Ephesians 4.12, pastors are given for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. You live as if the gospel were true, that hell is real and life is short and heaven is home for those in Christ. The greatest amount of gospel proclamation at Grace Bible Church is not done in this building and it is not done by the pastors. It is done by moms and dads at home with their little ones, by students at school, by athletes on their sports teams, by all of us in our neighborhoods and at work. And we're sending the layman's to Papua New Guinea again. And we're not sending them to bring a higher standard of living to tribal peoples, to improve their technologies, to bring them into the 21st century. We have sent the Laymans, the Cans, the Dodds, Amelia, the Mitchells to preach the gospel. And woe to them if they do not preach the gospel. Woe to us if we do not preach the gospel. A massive sea of humanity surrounds us on this globe, all without Christ rushing into eternity under the wrath of God for their sin. And God has created and redeemed and equipped us to be his instruments for rescuing people. Woe to us if we do not preach the gospel. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, I gave up nothing, I received everything. I count it the highest honor that God can confer on any man to call him to be a herald of the gospel. I'd like to ask the elders to come up. We're going to pray for the layman's, and then we're going to sing after that. that, Does that mess things up? Did I do that wrong? Are we supposed to sing first? Come up. We're going to pray, and this will be our closing prayer. So Jeremy, Lori, Greer, Bell, Knox, they're in class. I told Knox not to go to class. <laughs> All right, Jeremy and Lori, come on up. We'll have the elders pray. And uh, Scott Demarest, can I put you on the spot to lead us all in prayer for the layman's? Yep. Okay, let's pray. Father God, it is our privilege to speak the gospel. It is our privilege to take the gospel out of this place. And we come before you today for the layman's as they do that very thing. They take the gospel from this place to the other side of the world. Lord, they work by your grace. They serve by your grace. We pray, Lord God, that they would be faithful instruments in your hands, that as they take the gospel... You would allow the gospel message to be spoken through their plans, through their preparations, through their interactions with people, through their church attendance, through their church involvement, through the way they lead their families. Lord God, I pray for them. I pray for their marriage as they are going to be away from a place where they see good marriages on display every day. I pray for their parenting as they are going to be away from good examples of parenting, good encouragement, good resources. Lord, I pray for your grace to them as they raise their kids. I pray for them as they teach their kids. Lord God, there is much family life that will be taking place in PNG. And I pray that you would help them and you would sustain their family. Lord, I pray for the gospel message as they are there. Lord, that you would use their time and their place there 
to prepare the gospel for more teams to come, more villages to hear the gospel, more people who don't have a right understanding of this world and its creator and their need for a savior. Lord, I pray that you would be pleased to use this dear family as part of your plan to save those that you have chosen on the other side of the world. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.